So, um, yeah, as, as Marcus said, uh, 18 months ago, we moved to using Jav Pro, um, and Dan came along, set it up, broke our SAN and VMware, but claims it was our fault, I don't know. Uh, and so I wanted to talk about the, the various um, things that we then did after the jump start to make Jav Pro fit into our workflow um, and just to, to get it up to our, our, our standard way of doing things. My original pass of the talk was nearly two hours long, and I think Marcus probably would have had a stick with a hook on it and sort of pulled me off stage long before that. So um, sort of narrowing it down a little bit, particularly since James isn't here talking about his configuration. So I'm actually going to focus a bit more on how we deploy Jamf Pro and, and how we, we, we manage it and how we keep it running. So the question is, how do you deploy Jamf Pro? We're talking about on-premise here, obviously. Well, firstly, to deploy Jamf Pro, you just deploy Jamf Pro. You do it manually. You put it on your server, you follow the little wizard, and it installs. That's kind of a, a basic way. It's not how we particularly like to do things, but um, you know, it's you know, straightforward. Second thing, we can script it. Scripting um, can be a bit tricky, particularly for something as complicated as Jamf Pro. It has a lot of moving parts, and, and so it can be quite hard to script, and uh, Richard Purvis has had a, a go here with this uh, JSS in a box. If you've ever seen Monkey in a Box, this is like a homage to that. And it is 1,891 lines of bash to install it. It's um, quite a monster of a script. It's, it's pretty fantastic. I don't think you'd want to use it for your production system, um, just straight off, but it would certainly give you inspiration if you did want to use it. Uh, uh, just if you wanted to learn how to do the scripting side of it. So where are we going forward? Well, I'm going to suggest today is we do config management, or configuration management, so I'm going to lock the doors before you run away um, because it has a bit of a reputation, and my job, I think, today is to convince you, actually, um, it's pretty cool, and not everything you've heard about it might be true. So what is configuration management is, you know, the dictionary term. It is an effort of managing all of the administrative creation maintenance terms on, on a server. Um, rather than actually try and explain what it is, I think it's pretty easy to show you. But um, before we do that, the various platforms that you have out there, um, I'm going to be talking about using Puppet. Uh, Puppet's a, its own independent company, but there are other options out there like Ansible, which is kind of from Red Hat, Chef, Salt, CF Engine. Um, but we're going to stick with Puppet for today. And, and since it's sort of traditional to have a meme, I think this sort of explains the situation of where we are now. Sorry, I can't help myself. So what exactly is Puppet? Well, the official definition it is Puppet is a declarative model-based configuration management solution, which I think clears it up nicely um, and makes a lot of sense. Um, just bear in mind the term uh, declarative. We're going to come back to that quite a bit. Perhaps in the more of a diagram, as you can see, I, I once thought I was going to be a graphic designer, and yeah, it clearly wasn't going to work. But this little um, diagram here shows you what the setup looks like. You have a Puppet server. On the Puppet server, you have manifest files. They're written in YAML. Um, there are modules, data, encrypted data. The Puppet server then will go off to talk to Puppet Forge where modules are, and you can have a dashboard and, and various other databases. And then nodes, as in other servers, contact the Puppet server. And on the node, it can be any Linux machine, it can be a Mac, it can be um, Windows as well, um, you install a Puppet agent. And the Puppet agent talks to the Puppet server and says, hey, what have you got for me? This might sound quite familiar to something you might be using for your Macs. And so you could actually say that Puppet is monkey for servers. Um, but if you're more of a Bruce Wayne lives in Batman's attic kind of person, you might say that monkey is a puppet for Max. So for us, we want to set up two Jamf Pro servers. They're going to be clustered and a Jamf distribution point. And I'm going to show you how we do that using Puppet. Um, so the basic building block of Puppet is the manifest. These files are written in YAML, um, yet another markup language, which is possibly my least favorite markup language. Um, but hey, you've got to deal with it. So this, uh, this uh, manifest here is for our server JamfPO1. Um, we just define the node, JamfPO1.svi. And if we just run it like that, it does nothing. Or does it? It 
does actually do a little bit of stuff. The puppet agent will communicate with the puppet server. They'll do an exchange of what they call fax, which in Jamf terms, it does a Jamf recon equivalent of the server, and so you can find out lots of stuff that you need to know about it. Um, and it might do some other stuff that we'll talk about later, but just on its own, that's uh, the simplest thing. We're going to be dealing a lot with Puppet modules. Puppet modules are free um, classes that people have written, which will help you to um, manage various applications. They all exist on Puppet Forge. You just have to specify that you're using them in a, in a Puppet file, and um, there are a few different types of modules. Uh, they can be from Puppet themselves, or they can be official, which is a, a company has made a Puppet module, and Puppet has said, yeah, this is of a suitable standard, let's use it, let's do that. Um, or they can be like first party, for example, we used a, a couple of ones from Duo, and so Duo themselves have written the Puppet modules and published them to the Puppet Forge. So let's get stuck in, what's the first thing that uh, we need for Jamf Pro? It needs Java, so we'll use the Java module. And it's really as simple as that, we simply say class Java. Uh, Jamf Pro requires specifically the open JDK um, of pretty much any version. It's not too fussy, and, and uh, just by luck, that's what the default settings for this particular class does. So that single line in the manifest, run the Puppet Agent, and we haven't cared whether we're running it on Ubuntu, on Red Hat, or whatever, it will just install Java for you. This is the point about Puppet being declarative. You declare what you want. You don't have to worry too much how it actually happens. If we wanted to be a bit more precise, um, we could extend the, the way we installed the class here, so this would actually install Oracle Java, and we could pick the, the various versions of uh, Java if we wanted to, but we don't need to do that. We're quite happy just with, um, just with the standard Java that it's gonna give us. Um, next thing, because it's clustered, we want to install memcached, or memcached, never memcache. Please take note, Australians, who say that, so. Um, pretty straightforward, um, it just, install memcache, we specify how much RAM that it needs to use, and it needs to listen on a certain IP address. If you don't specify the IP address for memcache to listen on, it will only answer to local host, which defeats the whole point of having it. Um, need MySQL next. Jamf Pro wants either the community edition of MySQL directly from MySQL or the enterprise edition. It does not want Pacona or Maria, and as luck, that is the default for the, uh, the Puppet class for MySQL. Um, so just putting on that on there, we specify a root password, and by having removed default accounts, that does like the equivalent of a MySQL secure install. Then wanted to find a database. We just stick with the standard Jamf terms, call it Jamf software, the username, the password, and the permissions we're granting. You might be thinking at this point, ooh, are we gonna be reusing those variables? Maybe rather than just writing them out, we should variableize them. Um, absolutely, in a proper manifest, that's what we would do. We'd, you'd just simply dollar sign and that name and you can assign a variable. I, I'm trying to go for legibility here, so I'm, I'm, I'm not variableizing it. Also, passwords in config files are a bit horrible, so uh, we would store them in something called encrypted Hiera whereby we would put a private key on the Puppet server and then we can have public keys on all of our workstations and we can encrypt either just a string, like a, a password, or we can encrypt an entire file like um, a private key, for example, for SSL. Um, and, and that way everything is, is nice and secure. And then what Puppet will do is it will um, send it to the agent and it will get decrypted there. So MySQL is a pretty nice class. The next thing we need for, for uh, Jamf Pro is Tomcat. Tomcat is a bit of a harder class. Um, you actually have to say whereabouts it should go and get Tomcat from. It's not actually that hard, but we then just need to specify whereabouts on our server we want Tomcat to live. Uh, so that's what this uh, Catalina home option is. And we're saying put Tomcat and hence Jamf Pro in user local JSS Tomcat. Um, managed service just means that it will create a service for it. Jamf Pro itself is distributed, if you go for the manual installation on Jamf Nation in your assets, as a WAR file. Uh, WAR files are just a, a zip file with a specific folder layout. Uh, or we, we have to re-host it ourselves, and that's why the WAR source is from a, a local repository, because uh, Jamf doesn't just give you open access to download that. Um, also, if you are going to re-host this yourself, you obviously need to keep it private, because they won't appreciate you putting uh, Jamf Pro out on the internet. All that will happen here is that Puppet will copy the WAR file from that source, put it in the right folder, 
which we specified don't care to leave at home. And then Tomcat will then explode it or unzip it and then just start running. We just need to do a little bit of housekeeping, set some uh, Java and var um, environmental variables here, specifying how much uh, memory that Java Pro is going to use. Well, once we've got all of that installed, there's a lot of um, configuration files that we're going to need to interface with. And this is kind of Puppet's bread and butter. And for the first time, we're actually going to do some native Puppet commands. Um, one of the first files that we'd like to manage with Puppet is the database.xml. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory what it is. This has the database settings for Jamf Pro. Now, you don't have to do this. Jamf Pro will interactively ask you for these settings if you don't have this file in place. Um, I kind of like doing it because that means that the passwords are all contained in the manifest and you don't have to look them up. But also, for our secondary Jamf Pro node, um, if we put this file on, on there, and set it accordingly, then we don't ever actually have to touch a Jamf Pro secondary server. We don't even have to log on to it. It will just work. So it's actually kind of a, a zero touch deployment, which is pretty cool. But so we could just use this as, as this file. We could have it as a template and then put a template for each different server that we've got and just copy it on. But that's kind of stuck. So instead, we will variableize that. And this is using Puppet's EPP templating format. Uh, and as you can see, we've just got where it says host, dollar sign host. Uh, but the, the percent equals means print this value uh, of the value of, of the, the variable host. And so we just need to assign host to be localhost database to be Jamf software. And we'll do that back in the manifest. And uh, going from the bottom up, you can see the variables that are going to get copied over. The EPP thing is just saying whereabouts in uh, Puppet's manifest hierarchy the file actually lives. And then at the top, you can see where about that, that file is going to live on the server. So it's going to go in Tomcat, whether that's root, web, it's XML, database, or XML. A few other ones we need to take care of. Um, the log4j, this is some Tomcat Java file. I was trying to find the, the Jamf knowledge base on it, but they don't actually seem to make any mention of it at all on Jamf Nation. Um, I only really know from the CJO course. Um, there is. Um, uh, of course, a feature request to get this fixed, but uh, it doesn't have too many votes. This file, the reason we need to change it is, I guess, for historic reasons, it, it has the, the paths for the Mac, uh, and this is an installer that you can run on Windows and on Linux, and obviously, neither of those platforms have slash library. So we need to change this. Now, we could template the entire file, but one of the problems when you template an entire file is if you touch it, you own it. You, if anybody makes a change to this file subsequently, it will get overwritten by Puppet because it is declarative. Um, this file also could change in subsequent versions, and so I'd need to make sure that there's been an actual change to the file. So rather than templating it that way, I would just like to change and edit those lines. Now, if you're in Tony's workshop yesterday, hopefully you would have uh, had a good lesson on how to use SED. And something like this, SED, would be the traditional tool that you would search and replace the values of that. But actually, we can use uh, a much cooler tool in Puppet called Augeus. And Augeus, uh, what it does is it, it understands configuration files. And you can download various lenses for it, as it's called. And it can understand about 30 or 40 different files. And so all we need to do is say, set this value for this given key. So wherever it says, wherever the value in, the, in your configuration file is, log4, appender, jamf, cm file, set, this is the value. So uh, when we aim that bit of the manifest at this file, it will just come along and say, OK, log4j, I need to set everything to the right of the equal sign. And it works and so on many different configuration files. It's a really, really cool and powerful tool. Um, you can actually give it a go on your Macs if you just do brew install orgius. It's a Ruby gem. And then as an example, you can just say, all tool print files, which means use the file system, et cetera, hosts. And it will programmatically let you see what's in your host file on your Mac. And if you want to, you can then change it to all tool set and then actually set parts of your host file. Um, so that's how we deal with that one. Memcache has a few little config files we need to sort out as well. First of all, we have to tell Jamf Pro that we're using Memcache. Uh, and so that's just a straightforward uh, single line that we will drop in using a, an EPP template. There's nothing dynamic about that one. Um, 
But there's a slightly trickier one when we actually, um, memcache is in two files, we have to say use it, but then it's slightly trickier when we say these are the actual memcache nodes that we're gonna use. Um, the reason it's harder is because it's got this index where it says like zero and one in the square brackets. And so in, in the templating file, it's like, okay, well I can loop through all of them, but then I, I need to have some way of uh, incrementing that index. Uh, so, the different type of template file we can use in Puppet is an ERB, which is a Ruby template file. And as you probably know, Ruby is its own programming language in its own right. And, and so literally there's nothing you can't do because it is just a programming language. Uh, and all this, uh, this file is doing is setting a value of zero to i, go through each of the hosts that we tell it, and wherever it says that, that i, just print it, and then once it's gone through once, increment it. And so it'll just do one, two, three, four for each run. Uh, it looks slightly differently to the EPP format because this is an older way of doing things and it can access any variable in the entire manifest. Uh, so just when you're doing with ERB, it, it's just a slightly different format, uh, but still works in a very similar way. We definitely want to have a, a proper uh, SSL certificate on our, our Jamfro server. It makes life a lot easier. Uh, and to do that, we're going to be young, cool, and trendy like uh, we are, um, and use Let's Encrypt. Pretty straightforward uh, module again. Uh, all we have to do is specify an email address for ourselves. That's not actually our certificate of email. And say so this is the domain that we want the certificate for. Now, this is just gonna do a cert only, and so all that's gonna do is just drop the certificate to et cetera, let's encrypt live, and just leave it there. It's not gonna do anything else other than just drop a certificate onto the server, so it's not being used. And so we'll have to handle that in the next step. Uh, but also worth mentioning that Let's Encrypt, the, uh, the certificates expire after 90 days, and so we need to renew them. Uh, there's a tool they provide called CertBot that does that, and so by putting manage cron equals true, it's gonna set up CertBot, and every day at whatever time you specify, it's gonna say, do I need to renew the certificate? And 89 days out of 90, it's gonna go no, and on the 90th day, it will automatically renew the certificate for us. We need to then put that certificate into the Java key store, uh, this is probably one of the worst bits of software that you ever have to use. Um, Rich Trampson had a blog post last week about it, just um, saying how he, he was creating scripts just because it was so awful. It um, gives what is affectionately known as a Eurovision error frequently, which is a null point error. Okay, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, but fortunately, we don't have to touch it. Um, what this will do, we can use the uh, Java key store module from Puppet and it will take those lovely formatted PEM certificates, uh, which we, we've created from uh, Let's Encrypt, and it will convert those into P12s, P7, P12 p certificates that the Java key store needs, uh, which is nice because we don't know, otherwise we'd have to run it through OpenSSL ourselves. And it, we're just specifying whereabouts we should make the Java key store in that path. We have to set a password on the Java key store for security, um, I guess is what they say, but I don't quite know why. And we're ensuring that it's the latest. And this is one of the, an interesting puppet command. What this is actually saying is if those PEM files change, as in CertBot has renewed our Let's Encrypt, go and grab them and put them in here again. So it's always going to be keeping this up to date for us. We then have to move on to everybody's favorite part of setting up uh, Jamf Pro manually, which is the Tomcat connector file, which is a pretty horrific XML file um, where you have to specify many, many things. Doing it manually is very hard. Um, Rich Purvis in his script to do JSS in a box, he's actually setting line numbers to make changes to the file. He's a pretty good system administrator, so I think when he's having to set line numbers, you know it's pretty hard to interface with. Um, so I'm very grateful that there is a module that's gonna do it for us again here. There's quite a lot to take in, but it's not a particularly big deal. We just specify at the bottom whereabouts is the Java key store, what's the password for it, and the rest is fairly boilerplate. That list of ciphers will go all the way across Harris Street. It's incredibly long, various ciphers you can use for the protocols, and we're just saying at the top, let's listen on port 8443. I'll pause for a moment. Does anybody here have to worry about PCI DSS compliance? So if you're in the credit card industry and you're storing credit cards, you would need to adhere to PCI DSS. From the 30th of June, this Saturday, uh, they have deprecated TLS version one. So if you are working in that field, in banking field or whatever, 
you would need to ensure that none of your servers were accepting connections using the protocol TLS1. It's not particularly interesting that, that why, um, but have a think about it. If you were told to make sure that none of your servers are running TLS v1, how would you do it? Do you run a scanner? Would you try and remember whereabouts all the config files are? I think one of the, the beautiful things about Puppet is it gives us real clarity into the way that our servers are set up. If we wanted to know if we were running TLS v1, we simply look at the manifest file. We don't even have to go onto the server. There it is. How do we change it and turn off TLS, TLS v1? We would just delete it, and that would be it. So I think it gives you this amazing insight into the way that your servers are set up. I mean, basically, this manifest, aside from the installation, is controlling about 20 or 30 different config files. And if you've ever been on a server trying to you know, look through that config file, now it's in another one, you can forget doing all of that. Instead, it's all on one single page for you, uh, which is pretty impressive. And likewise, if we want to look across lots of servers, this is just um, all of our manifests just exist in Git, or, and you can download them all. You can just do finding files, and you could search through 20 or 30 files pretty quickly to find out the ones that you needed to update. Uh, so you, you do get this amazing insight, certainly using configuration management. One final step for the SSL, uh, Tomcat, um, the Tomcat connector only picks up the, the certificates from the Java key store when it restarts. So what we are doing here is we subscribe to a file, which basically just means look at that file, let me know when it changes, and we subscribe to the Java key store file. And then when it changes, run this command. And the command we're going to run is restart Tomcat. Uh, Trent, who's our system administrator and a real expert of uh, Puppet at work, he said this is possibly about the worst way of doing it, running an exec. You, you should subscribe as a service, and uh, generally it's a bit of a last resort. But I think it's quite useful to see that just for a file changing, you can run any command you like on your server. Um, in, that, yeah, in that command field, it could be literally any bash or, or terminal command that you wanted to. If you're not too happy with the idea that your Jamf Pro is going to be restarted randomly four times a year, then maybe Let's Encrypt isn't for you. Um, but you could uh, just drop out the Let's Encrypt module, put your certificate on there, and, and the same would happen. And then when your certificate expired in a year or so's time, it would do it for you that way. So it's, it's not too uh, hazardous. It's interesting here in Jamf talk earlier that they're replacing the, um, the, the backup tool for Jamf Pro. Uh, I am not fond of the backup at all, and so I use Auto MySQL Backup. Uh, it's actually what we use on all of our MySQL servers anyway, so it's a bit of consistency. We simply say, here's the backup directory, and it will then run a backup of MySQL, all of the databases for us um, every day, uh, and send us an email when it's done. One of the things you find with configuration management is it will influence which packages you actually want to install in the first place. Um, when we were setting these up, I, again, I said to Trent, I said, oh, you know, we, we obviously want to use UFW firewall on Ubuntu and firewall command on, on Red, Red Hat CentOS. He says, no, no, we're going to use IP tables. I said, oh, but I hate IP tables. It's really hard. The configuration's like this. And he goes, no, 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 no. Because we're doing it this way, it's going to be a lot easier. I'm like, oh, OK. And so we actually selected to use IP tables, not so much based on how good it is as a product, but instead on how easily we could manage it. You might think that's kind of the tail wagging the dog a little bit. You might not think IP tables is that hard to configure, but um, as you can see, setting the firewall here is, is, a, is a piece of cake. We're just simply saying, these are the ports we want to listen on. We're accepting it on TCP. Job done. It's that simple. Um, if we wanted to be a bit more flash, then we could say, all right, we're just going to accept MySQL connections only from our secondary server. Uh, likewise, you might want to block off SSH only to your IT computers if you wanted to as well. Um, but yep, just managing the firewall like that is it, pretty simple. So that's all the components we need uh, for a Jamf Pro server. Let's have a look at what it looks like when it runs. So I'm just going to make uh, a VM from a template in VMware, which is going to flash by very, very quickly, hopefully. And it's just going to be Ubuntu 16.04. Go on there, and we'll run Puppet Agent T, which is like a testing version. As you can see, this is where it's uh, getting lots and lots of facts about it all, moving over private keys, setting up loads of other stuff. Um, and there's quite a bit of red. Now, there's red on there because we've got a bit of a race condition in our manifest. We drop a war file onto Tomcat. Tomcat explodes out the, the, um, the files. And some of those files are the files that we want to edit. Uh, so 
Puppet has already moved on by that point. It's sort of like way ahead of uh, Tomcat doing the, the unzipping. And so it goes to write to the files that we specified and goes, well, that file doesn't exist, and that's what that red error is representing. If this was the sort of thing that was going to cause issues on like subsequent runs, it's something we'd totally fix. But instead, you can just run Puppet multiple times <laughs> and just kind of ignore that. So when it's an initial setup, I think that's a, a reasonable thing to do. And in fact, for our, um, our, our, our Samba servers, we actually have to reboot the server before we get a, a clean run. Um, but there, there are ways of fixing it, which uh, I don't really want to go into. And, and so when we run it, finally, it all goes, it's all clear. Go to the Jamf Pro, and up it starts. And as you can see, it didn't prompt us for a database there because it had the conditions. So why do we want to use configuration management? Well, it's easier. I hope I've shown that in those 60 lines of code, we set up something that would have taken a lot, lot longer if we were going to script it, and uh, probably you know, a, a bit quicker in some ways than if we were doing it manually, particularly if we want to do it again. It's quicker. Quicker and easier, kind of the same thing, aren't they? Well, let's set up our Java Pro secondary server. File, save as, change the name to the Jamf PO2 for the manifest, and yeah, slow typo. And then do a search and replace for where it says Jamf PO1 and change it to Jamf PO2. Done, and then just chop out the bits we don't need. We only don't need MySQL on the secondary, and we don't need to run backups, but we'll keep everything else in there. And, oh yeah, we'll take off MySQL from the firewall. And we're done. So that's our secondary server done. Moving on to our distribution point, which I promised you before, uh, we need to set up a file server in Linux and a web server. This is even quicker. I'm cheating big time here because I'm using a profile, which is a structural element from Puppet that we have set up previously for our other Linux file servers. And by including that, it is going to join the, the server to our Active Directory domain, set up Kerberos, install ZFS, and do a whole load of other stuff in Samba for us. Uh, and then, as you can see, here are the Samba settings that we need to do. So we're not just taking advantage from the same application suite. It's not just like, oh, well, we're setting up server A and server B, and we'll copy from A to B. We're also able to say, well, we've already set up this on a different server that does something else completely differently. Let's go and use the work that we've done previously on this one. And, and you'll find that as the further you, you get on with it, the bigger that your Puppet um, repository becomes, the more that you will borrow from other servers that you have set up. Um, yeah, so this is just a straightforward Samba, Samba setup. Uh, oops, sorry. And yeah, and, and this is the Apache web server. Again, we're cheating. We're not using Let's Encrypt this time. We're using our regular SSL wildcard certificate. We just grab from there, and you can see we do this little lookup, which is a Hiera lookup to put the certificate in there. Um, again, pretty straightforward. Um, we just need to set a little uh, basic authentication password for, to keep it secure-ish. Um, just let the, the distribution point run. So that will run, join to the domain, install all the same stuff. It's not really that fascinating a one, but it, <laughs> okay, yeah, so you can see it's setting up Samba, it's doing WinBind, um, joining, creating Apache. And because it's, it's not really much point showing you a file server, instead this is the configuration file that it's created for Apache, and this is the configuration file that it created for Samba. So there's a lot of work there that we've already done, we were able to reuse. I think the other advantage of it is it's self-documenting. I put my little trough face there because I'm not saying it's replacing documentation. You can't just say, oh, I'm not going to bother writing anything about this server, but boy, do you have to write a lot less documentation about your server by doing this. It's just, how is it set up? Go and have a look at the manifest. We get the benefits of version control. We use a technology called um, Puppet R10K. Uh, there are lots of different ways of setting up Puppet, uh, but this particular way, we have a local copy of our Puppet repository on our machines. We make a change. We, we um, commit them into Git. They get pushed up to our GitLab server. 
And then um, on the actual Puppet server itself, we download it and we run Puppet R10K, uh, and it downloads the latest version out of source control. It grabs any Puppet modules that we need to get from Puppet Forge. And, and obviously, by looking at it in version control, we can see who has made a change when. Uh, and it's quite a nice way of saying, oh, that, I made that change back then. I want to revert back to it. Or why is it set up like this? I know I will talk to the person who set it up in that way. Talked a bit about declarative state. This is really the key about Puppet. We declare how we want a server set up. We don't necessarily need to worry too much about how the sausage is made. Instead, we just say we want a sausage, which is a terrible analogy. Um, but by declaring things, um, <laughs> we, we also get to prevent drift from our baseline. And if you, in security, this is a particularly big deal. Our Puppet agent runs every half hour by default. Every time it runs, it will check to see if something has changed. And so if you've changed one of those template files that we've specified, Puppet will go, oh, hang on a moment, I'm managing that, and it will put it back to the way that it should be, at least according to it. It can be a bit a little frustrating if you're troubleshooting that you make some changes and then Puppet comes along and overwrites it. But conversely, um, I, I don't know if you've ever um, turned a firewall off to do some troubleshooting and then not realized for hours, days, months, or whatever that it's, it's turned off. Well, the good thing about Puppet is the next time Puppet runs, it's going to say, hey, that firewall's off. I'm turning it back on again. It does mean that you really have to make all of your changes through Puppet, because if you make a change on a file that isn't managed by Puppet, Puppet doesn't care. Or if you want to make a change, make it in Puppet, and then let it go through there, and you can do a manual Puppet run. But I definitely think it improves your security significantly by, um, by preventing this baseline drift. Also. You get a lot for free in Puppet. When I said at the beginning, you know, there's anything happening in this manifest where there was no um, classes and so on, one of the things it's doing is it's going to our base class and it's saying, okay, well, is there anything I can install on there? And that happens all behind the scenes. And it would have said, yeah, uh, use these app repositories, set up the duo two-factor authentication, put our SSL keys on, set up a basic firewall as well, uh, allowing SSH only from certain uh, subnets. And so that's a lot of stuff that you don't ever have to think about. And if you think you're setting up a server, trying to remember all of the little things that you need to do it can be quite, you know, quite hard work. And then if you forget, oh dear, is your server somewhat worse off for it? But by having it in a base class, it's all included. So you're never not going to have that, uh, which definitely, I think, improves your security. So should you use configuration management? Well. If you identify as a system administrator, or you think that that's something you're going to be doing in your future, yes. Yes, you should absolutely be doing configuration management. Configuration management's not going to be big into 2020. It's not going to be big in 2015. It was big in 2015. That was the year of Puppet on the server. It should be a core skill for system administrators. Um, we've recently been hiring, and this was one of the things that we were looking out for. It is definitely a tool set you should have. So. Um, with that in mind, how do you get started on here? Well, uh, Puppet have an excellent uh, beginner's guide, and you can just download from there a VM, and you'll run the VM, and it will put you through all these training tasks. And by the time you got through it, you'll be pretty much an expert, and it's, it's available for free. They do collect your name, telephone number, and so on. So make sure that you put them in accurately so that they can get in touch with you to sell you it, or not. <laughs> uh, but otherwise, um, all of the other um, vendors have uh, various ways of, uh, of getting started as well. Um, if you're wondering which configuration management to use, my number one uh, piece of advice is look what you have in your organization. I, if you work for a university, there's a reasonable chance that your Unix team is using one of them. Uh, for example, um, I'm good friends with people at Melbourne Uni, their Unix team use Puppet. They get to use their Puppet Enterprise license and they have access to support. Uh, additionally, one of the advantages if you have Puppet support, they provide training for free every year, providing you do it, which is pretty cool for a vendor to provide free training, providing you by support. Any people? <coughs> uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. Um, and additionally, it's very handy um, knowing people who do it as well, because it's something you're going to need to ask a lot of questions about. If you just embark on this on your own, it's going to be pretty tough. Um, but, you know, I, I've asked multiple questions to my friend who works at the university and say, how about this, how about that? I even encountered what I thought was a bug, 
And I said, do you know how we don't have puppet support, but you do? Um, would you be able to see if this works for you? <laughs> he came back and said, oh, actually, no, we've already raised that with them, and here's the fix. But um, definitely getting to know people um, can be helpful. Furthermore, one of the biggest meetups in Melbourne I know that people go to is InfraCoders. They run it quite often at Telstra. And they fill up, fill up the auditorium. They literally don't let people in sometimes because it's so popular. But uh, they run, I think, once a fortnight. And they talk all about DevOps and configuration management. It's a very large part of that. So if you actually want to go along to a meetup to learn more, uh, that is a good place to do it. Well, I forgot my next slide until David reminded me earlier and said, well, how is your alcoholic son getting on? And so <laughs> I'm pleased to say that he's still up to his high his chinks. Uh, unfo oh, where's it gone? Oh, no? There you go. Oh, there you go. There he is, little angel. So, uh, yes, he, he is uh, continuing along the family tradition. Unfortunately, he now has a partner in crime who uh, very much likes stealing daddy's beer as well. So, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, any questions?